Hello, I'm Michelle from IRIS. Welcome to this IRIS on electronic monitoring in the criminal justice system. I'm delighted to be joined by the authors of our most recent insight, Insight 40, on electronic monitoring. Um, Jill McIver and Hannah Graham from the Scottish Centre for Criminal Justice Research at the University of Stirling. A very warm welcome to you both. Thank you for being here. Okay, so just to get us started, by way of introduction, could you say what electronic monitoring actually is and what it's used for? Just very briefly. Electronic monitoring is uh, a form of technology that can be used to monitor the presence or absence of a convicted person, or in Scotland they're convicted people. Um, but there are a range of different technologies available, so there's not one form of electronic monitoring. There are three broad categories. One is radio frequency monitoring, where the individual wears a device, uh, usually around their ankle, um, which transmits a signal to a unit located within, usually within their house, and that enables the monitoring centre to detect whether or not the person is actually in the property at the designated times of the curfew. So usually electronic monitoring is used as part of a curfew to ensure or to respond to compliance with the requirement that they stay in a particular location for a particular period of time. Or in some cases, it can also be used to exclude people from particular locations. For example, um, someone might be excluded from a supermarket for mm -hmm. if they're prolific shoplifters. Right. So there are, there are various ways in which the technology can be used. The other type of technology is GPS, uh, which uses GPS signals to locate uh, where a person is in real time and it can do so in real time, mm -hmm. so it can detect the person's movements. And the, the ways in which that technology can be used are slightly different because it's possible with the use of GPS to create exclusion zones around particular locations to detect whether or not the person who's wearing the tag approaches these particular locations. Great. Uh, and, and, and if necessary, uh, alert the police to the fact that, they, that they're appro approaching. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's an element of protection of victims involved in that particular use of technology. Great. And there's a lot more detail in the actual inside and evidence summary itself on that, isn't there? Yeah. So you both are quite, would I say, passionate about this topic. Why is that? Well, both of us have a particular interest in community sanctions and measures, and perhaps in um, ethical and effective ways of reducing the use of imprisonment and internationally electronic monitoring and the use of technology has come to the fore quite a lot in recent years, it's become even more prominent in Scotland and I think that we, we have an interest in understanding how it's used and how it could be used but with the emphasis on exploring um, ethical and effective ways of having community sanctions and measures or um, perhaps not using prison as much as Scotland has done and where it's used as a form of early release from prison um, to see that that's being used in a way that supports people to return to their communities because technology is versatile and can do many things but we're interested in better understanding how it's used, the impact on people's everyday lived experiences. Um, so I think we, we both became interested in its use at the more it became a priority in Scotland. And also I, I had the opportunity, um, along with a range of policy makers and practitioners in Scotland, to take part in one of the technology trials as the Scottish Government in 2016. So you um, actually wore an electronic yeah, tag indeed. for a period, just um, as a test obviously. Yeah, yeah. A, a big um, GPS electronic monitoring tag which isn't currently available in Scotland but the Scottish Government are considering putting something before the Scottish Parliament to look at or enable its use if that passes. And so for the technology trial I was um, tagged in my office and also had a visit to my home wow, okay. um, and that's not one that is based on a curfew but I had exclusion zones and uh, wore it for a week. Um, so you couldn't go to the shops or you couldn't go to particular yeah, places? My, my particular exclusion zones I think were around shops and the university and 
particular parts of the highway yeah. um, because we needed to see how it was used on, on trains, on the Glasgow subway, mm -hmm. um, up to Stirling and also you realise what it's like to wear it at home, in bed, in the shower. Um, comfortable? Not comfortable? No, not at all. <laughs> I, I mean, you, you stop noticing it after uh, a period of time but it's like having a large plastic child's toy it's quite heavy, it's quite ugly, people will notice that you can't wear oh. boots over the top of um, a GPS mm. tag, so it's a lot larger than it's the radio than frequency ones. Bigger than mm. these types of things. Yeah, it's, it's quite big. So. so it's quite identifying then, so... Indeed, and yeah. I didn't tell people why I was wearing it. So I went out in public, I wore it to work. Work would have known why I was wearing it, but in public I wore it in coffee shops and through other university campuses and people's responses were curiosity, uh, fear, uh, surprise because you're wearing something that they might have only seen in American films rather than uh -huh. in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, or children tend to notice it first because it's quite big and obvious and perhaps closer to their height. Did you have children speak to you about it and go, what's that? Yeah, or? they were fairly easy going, whereas some of the adults had a slightly more fearful, pretend you didn't notice, look up, don't know what that is, um, uncertain response. Uh, some people had a, a fairly assertive or grumpy response, or you must be a criminal, you must have done this. But in some ways it was also mediated by my gender. So I, I was a woman wearing it. Mm -hmm. Common public perceptions aren't necessarily that women have done um, particularly high profile or violent things. Whereas if a man was wearing it, they might have potentially researchers suggested from other jurisdictions greater concerns about oh, what has he done and is he um, a sex offender or a domestic abuser so um, that I mean that might be the case as to why someone needs to wear one but we were interested in um, getting a sense of people's responses without telling them and it invited some very interesting conversations a lot of neighbours, people in, the, in Tesco um, were fairly intrigued once they got talking to you and realised um, this, this is a way of monitoring where people are mm. and it might be used in a conversation with a criminal justice social worker if it's rolled out in the future um, or as a form of accountability. Mm -hmm. Excellent, good experience, okay. So when was electronic monitoring then introduced into Scotland and how does it compare to other countries in terms of its use? <coughs> it, it was first used in Scotland in 1998, uh, introduced on a, pi a pilot basis in three different areas of Scotland. Uh, Aberdeen, Peterhead and Hamilton and when it was first introduced um, we, we should also uh, emphasise that in Scotland at the moment it's only radio frequency monitoring that's, that's available um, so that's the form where the person wears a tag in this box in their, their house um, so it was introduced on a pilot basis as in the context of a restriction of liberty order which is an order that can be made by the courts to restrict people to particular premises for given periods of time or away from premises. So it was first piloted in three locations. It was a relatively small scale pilot. Um, I think it's also, I think there was also a bit of resistance around the concept of electronic monitoring um, at the time, um, particularly perhaps from criminal justice social workers because First of all, it was seen as quite a punitive measure. The, the, the monitoring intrinsically is not a rehabilitative mechanism. Mm -hmm. It can be used in the context of a package of rehabilitation, but the, the monitoring itself was seen as something that was fairly punitive. Sure. Um, and also the fact that it was a private, the private sector were involved in operating the equipment and tagging people and monitoring uh, their compliance with the, the curfews. Um, so I think social workers felt a bit uncomfortable about both of these aspects. So when it was introduced, it was very much as a kind of standalone option. And so people were monitored, uh, but there weren't necessarily any other packages of support put into place. Since uh, that early use, um, electronic monitoring has been made available at a number of points in the criminal justice system. So it's now used, for example, as part of a, uh, a licence on release from prison, um, where it's, it's, it's referred to as a home detention curfew. So people who are, ser who are serving uh, relatively short sentences can be released early back into the community and spend the, the last part of their sentence in their own homes, uh, being monitored 
of the curfew. It can also be used as part of a uh, drug treatment and testing order, but very little use is made of it in that context. Um, it can be used as part of a parole licence, um, and there it's very often part of quite a complex package of conditions that are put into place um, where the people who've committed more serious offences are released back into the community. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not used to a large extent uh, with parole. And I think finally, it's, it's all, it can also be used with young people through the children's hearing system. Um, and there it tends to be used as part of a package of support to avoid young people being received into residential care. Okay. Again, the numbers involved are very low. The majority of people who are given uh, curfews, uh, electronic mo electronically monitored curfews in Scotland, are either on restriction of liberty orders, which are now following the, the initial pilot, are available across the country, or they're on a home detention curfew following early release from prison. Okay. And in terms of other countries then, it's been used elsewhere. So where is Scotland in comparison to other countries in Europe, for example? Our use is, compared to other jurisdictions, our use is relatively low. Um, although the different jurisdictions make use of different types of electronic monitoring for slightly different purposes at slightly different points in the criminal justice system. So it's very difficult to make direct comparisons. Um, but compared, for example, to England and Wales, Scotland makes relatively, relatively little use of electronic monitoring. There's been quite a cautious approach. Um, I think in Scotland there has been a concern not to begin to make a lot of use of something that perhaps some of the potential implications, the ethical concerns haven't been mm -hmm. uh, considered. So there's been a resistance uh, to widespread use and, and partly also because it's typically used in the absence of other uh, supports and services that would enable the person perhaps to begin to address the reasons underlying their offending and also access the supports that might, might be necessary to help to reintegrate them mm. back into society. Mm. I suppose something that's not touched on too much in the insight is the sort of controversial issues around the ethical concerns and things. What are those concerns really and what are the issues around it? I guess so this is, this is a type of technology and in these cases most of the examples that Gil has just given are examples that are a form of punishment. Um, it's something that's worn, so it's on your body. Um, it involves people coming into your home and touching your body and installing things in the home or having um, an awareness of where you are. So even at the level of an individual, it does involve giving up or yielding a level of privacy and or of liberty. Um, so the restriction of liberty will keep you in. Um, the level of privacy can be with home curfews but more so with live location monitoring with GPS tagging and tracking. And so there's, there's questions, uh, valid questions about the level of surveillance uh, that's involved in electronic monitoring when other types of orders or approaches don't involve knowing where people are or with the alcohol monitoring through a tag, if that were to be used, there's questions or ethical controversies about how it would be used. So would it be used to support more recovery with an integrated health and justice approach, for example, for someone whose offending is alcohol related? Or would it be used to, in a simple way and possibly in, in a punitive way to just be like, well, you've relapsed, that's non-compliance and mm -hmm. Uh, given what we know about people who habitually use alcohol in harmful ways and where it's implicated in their offending, we'd need to think about supporting recovery as well as monitoring compliance. So some of those are more so in the future um, and being thought about at the moment with the potential for new legislation to come into Scotland. But there are sort of ethical controversies or, or amongst practitioners, as Gil has said, um, the, the privatisation of punishment has been something that social care and social work practitioners are thinking about of why couldn't this be done through public services mm -hmm. and it, it does involve people's homes. The other one is um, 
the involvement of people it affects. So if I've committed a crime, um, I'll be considered as an individual through the criminal justice system. But electronic monitoring where there's a home curfew involves my household in terms of um, people could be visiting to check the technology and are allowed in your curfew hours, often between um, 7 p.m. at midnight. They don't have to announce that they're coming. You could have private sector workers coming in. Now, I get, that's usually done with a level of graciousness and like they're, they're hello, we just need to check this. It will be up focused on the technology. It won't be involving particularly personal conversations. But some people say, how does that affect families and children? Um, or other members of the household, is their consent involved? And I think these are really valid questions mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. asking yeah, absolutely. where it involves someone's household. Mm -hmm. So then, moving forward then, what would you like to see develop or happen in terms of electronic monitoring in Scotland? When we look at other jurisdictions, and particularly some of the European jurisdictions, um, we can see that it has been used much more as part of an integrated package of interventions and support. And I think what we've seen in Scotland is a fairly routinised use of electronic monitoring. So it tends to be a curfew that has been put into place, as Hannah said, from 7, till seven in the evening till 7 in the morning. Um, and that tends, there has, there has been perhaps less imaginative and creative use of electronic monitoring in Scotland than there might have been which involved both thinking about how a curfew might be used um, to work with the individual and reinforce, so for example, the fact that they're not allowed to go to be out of their house at, at particular times. So there could be discussions around how do they make, what kind of use do they make of their leisure time, what do they do, are there other interests that they can develop. But also in, in, other, in other countries um, we also see a kind of tapering off of the requirements over time so that the curfew periods are perhaps shortened if people are complying. Um, and that, so that can be rewarding people recognising mm -hmm. that, sure. they, that they have yeah. complied. Uh, some of the, the Scandinavian countries in particular also have requirements that people who are electronically monitored, and these are people generally who would have been in prison otherwise, but they're also required to be involved in some kind of purposeful activity, such as employment or education. Um, so there are, there are ways in which I think you know, more could be done to see electronic monitoring as part of a wider package of support, rather than it simply being used as a mechanism for determining whether or not people have adhered to the terms of um, a curfew that's been issued through the courts or as a condition of release from prison. Sure, that makes sense. And I don't know whether I'm going to be Yeah, so I, I would agree. Um, I think to use it, one of our big questions that we're learning in Europe from the evidence is um, what is the goal or what is the purposes of its use? And there may be more than one, and it might be about trying to reduce the use of imprisonment um, in ethical and effective ways. But also for the individual, what types of other supports or goals are around leaving crime behind mm -hmm. and, and being uh, living independently of criminal justice supervision, um, contributing to community, having the resources and supports as a citizen to do that. And so where there's rehabilitative supports, but also um, a celebration and a focus around if they uh, have their children able to be not only restricted away from certain things, but there might be a conversation with a, a social worker or a support worker around how this contributes to and tries not to inhibit other positive things like volunteering, working, studying, picking up children or participating in um, activities relating to them, going to women's centres, having things that are tailored to the individual because I think we will see people flourish more so where its use is proportionate so not added to every sentence or in every case, but is used imaginatively um, to support the things that we know also help change because um, tech doesn't necessarily um, change lives. We can wear other forms of tech and not necessarily change our behaviours or patterns mm -hmm. just because we're wearing a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think this is a way of understanding that human development and support to to leave crime behind will take quite a few more 
other avenues, so in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in Norway, we see that happening quite positively. And I think S Scotland and the Scottish Government are increasingly looking to the evidence and we're happy to be part of that conversation along with the practitioners and others. Excellent. Well, that's probably a great place to wrap it up. I'd like to thank you both very much for coming in to speak to us today and thank you for watching. <laughs>